Hello and welcome for a second time to Africa, the countryside of South Africa, just outside Johannesburg. For the second in our series with Credo Mutwa, the Zulu Sanusi, or shaman, as many people around the world would call him, the keeper of the history, the true history of Africa and the Zulu people, and the official storyteller, in other words, the carrier of the knowledge and the symbolic stories of the Zulu nation. He is, without any question in my mind whatsoever, the most remarkable, astonishing man it's been my honor to meet. And to share his incredible knowledge has been a time I personally will never forget. In the first of these videos, we discussed with Credo uh, the story of the Chittahuli, the reptilian extraterrestrial race from another world that came to the earth in the far ancient world that brought advanced knowledge which built many of the according to conventional history unexplainable magnificent structures um, all across the world thousands and thousands of years old and also interbred with humanity creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines these bloodlines as my own research uh, for books like The Biggest Secret and Credo's immense knowledge of the African history uh, which he's gathered in his nearly 80 years of traveling this vast and amazing continent both correlate the same story remarkably that this Chittahuli, this reptilian race interbred with humanity and the bloodlines became the almost demigods, the royal ruling lines of the ancient world, particularly in the ancient Near and Middle East, which were the middlemen, if you like, between the extraterrestrial gods to which people were literally sacrificed and the people in general. And as the genealogical research is showing, these crossbreed bloodlines, the Nephilim, as the Old Testament of the Bible calls them, the result of the interbreeding between the sons of God, as the Bible calls them, the sons of the gods in the true translation, and earth women. The marriage, the uh, bringing together of the sons of God and the daughters of men. This Nephilim crossbreed race, as the genealogy has shown, came out of that area and into Europe to become the aristocracy and the royal families of Europe, and then through the British Empire, became uh, the ruling bloodlines of most of the world. In fact, today, almost all of the world. Like the 42 presidents out of the hundreds of millions of people who have been Americans since the Declaration of Independence in 1776, 42 have become president. They're all related. What? And they go back to these ruling aristocratic families, which eventually go back to the crossbreed uh, inter- relationship intercourse between the Chittahuli, the Anunnaki, as some accounts call them, and human beings. And it's the British Empire that we're going to talk about now in its relationship to taking over the planet in a way that today is now global. The British Empire um, became the British Empire because this network of bloodlines which had become known as the Illuminati centered itself in London at operational level uh, particularly after the arrival from Holland of William of Orange who became King of England in 1689 and from that time um, he signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the banking system as we know it started to expand and emerge but from that time the British Empire and the other European empires came into being and they took the planet over now one immensely important area that they completely controlled and raped was the fantastic continent of Africa. And to look at how Africa was taken over by this Illuminati, Chittahuli, reptilian crossbreeds, and uh, indeed the reptilian race itself that's behind it all, is to see how the world has been taken over, the methods used, the way it was done, the manipulations. And what we're going to talk to uh, Credo about now, among many other things, is the way that the continent of Africa was hijacked by the Illuminati. 
and I asked him first to tell me the story of how this great continent was taken over. You see, there are mysteries in this world that we as thinking human beings must look into. And one of these mysteries is this. There is overwhelming evidence of the fact that before Africa was actually colonized by the white people from Europe, it was first prepared by strange people for this colonization. When the first Portuguese ships started sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, strange beings appeared amongst our people, strange human-like creatures, usually creatures of great height, abnormally tall, human-like beings, some of them with only one foot, appeared amongst our people and they started doing things there which, which made it easier for the colonialists to invade us and to conquer us. What were they like in terms of their color and skin, Credo? Say, we do not know, but there are those who described them as very, very white, chalk white in appearance. <coughs> this went on for so often that it became traditional to our people to represent these beings with white chalk. You found masks amongst our, our mask makers which were smeared entirely in white chalk to represent these creatures. These creatures were usually about eight feet tall very, very slender, and they used to wear robes made of the, the tanned hides of certain type of antelope, usually the, the intensely black sable antelope. What, what name did the uh, people give to them? We gave them the, 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 the name Izilo Zengubo the beasts of the terrible blanket. These creatures were dressed exactly like Christian monks, with hoods and long robes. In fact, I will draw you a likeness of one of them as it is shown in a rock painting. Now, these creatures used to live in holes in the ground or in, in, in uh, 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 underground uh, uh, in underground caverns or in, in, in gullies over which a roof of logs and, and vegetation as well as swords was placed. And it may be of interest to you, sir, that Portuguese explorers and Portuguese seamen used to see these one-legged creatures hopping about and sometimes disappearing into the ground as if by magic. And these creatures were called by the Portuguese sailors monopods. They wore a long robe that reached down to their ankles. 
and they appeared as they moved through the bush as if they only had one leg. Monopods were seen in Africa and they were also seen in America before America was colonized by the white people. Among the Native Americans? Yes, sir. The, one of the <coughs> one of the things that amazed me is that the story of America and the story of Africa was the same. It is said say, that these monopoles introduced certain knowledge to our people. They actually prepared our people mentally for what was to come. For example, these monopods, these uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, used to wear a cross-like ornament on their chests as a charm, a cross made of either gold or silver. Doesn't it amaze you that when the Native Americans saw the cross painted on the, on the sails of Christopher Columbus's ships, they recognized it as a sacred object. Let me tell you, sir, exactly the same happened in South Africa, where our people were made familiar with the cross long before the white man set foot in Africa. And when our people saw this cross, this time brought by missionaries, they recognized it as a sacred object. In other ways, now, I don't know how to put this there, but can you put it for me? Our people were prepared long beforehand to, to recognize certain Christian symbol and Judaic symbols. And when they saw them in the hands of the colonists later, they saw them for what they were. This is one of the reasons why, Mr. Ike, Africans accepted and protected Christian missionaries, even while fighting a life and death struggle against white colonialism. How is it that a man would accept the religion of an invader while at the same time fighting a life and death battle against the encroachments that this invader was making into his native land? This happened in America and this happened in Africa, and the, 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 the sources of this uh, 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 acceptance were the same. I, I wish I could put this in much better English than I'm, use, I'm using now, because I feel it is important. I, th I think you, you, you're putting it um, very clearly, that it seems that this Chittahuli um, were uh, going around the world, preparing for the uh, occupation from the Illuminati Center in London and Europe of these various areas like Native America and Africa. Yes, sir. The, the story, you see, a great fraud is being committed in educational circles in that the educationists in their ivory towers force our young people to look at the colonization of Africa and America as if they were two separate uh, uh, in incidents. But certain factors in this colonization 
were the same in Africa and the same in America, and they achieved exactly the same results. This is why I always argue that the conspiracy, the international conspiracy, began long, long before colonial, colonial times in Africa and in the Americas. <coughs> and the results were the same. Look at this. Here is the great Zulu king, Shaka. Shaka is a warrior second to none. Shaka is also a prophet second to none. Shaka welcomes white people <coughs> to his empire of Natal. Shaka allows missionaries to operate freely through his country. And when Shaka dies, before Shaka died, he warned his half-brother, Dinga, that he must, under no circumstances, attack the white people, and that he must allow missionaries to operate freely amongst the Zulu people. In fact, during the reign of King Dinga and Shaka's half-brother, two missionaries, Reverend Halstead and Reverend Owen, had a mission station within sight of King Dingan's great village. But wait, sir, let me point out one thing. These missionaries were converting our people to Christianity, and they often went out of their way to criticize and undermine the king's authority in the eyes of their converts. In other words, we have an amazing phenomena here where a great king is being undermined by the very people he has allowed to preach freely in, in his country. Why? Not a single South African scholar has ever asked himself why. Why, <coughs> why were our people so seemingly stupid as to allow a foreign religion into their country? Now, let me show you, sir, two horrendous tragedies. When the Belgians colonized the Congo, which is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, King Leopold declared that the Congo was to be his personal property. And King Leopold and his men tortured and murdered several million black Congolese people in an act of genocide equal only to what the Nazis were later to do to the Jews. But under savage ill-treatment, under savage torture and humiliation, the Congolese, virtual slaves in their country, still respected Christian missionaries and followed them and gained hope from them. And in 1907, this time in the country today known as Namibia, the Germans embarked on a policy of genocide against the warrior people known as the Hereros. They murdered so many Hereros. They tortured and slaughtered so many men and women of that, of that nation, nation that for the, until as recently as the 1940s, Herero women 
were still so traumatized by what had happened that they were not producing any young at all. But in spite of the hideous genocide committed by General Van Trotha, in spite of the multiple murders, the Herero people clung to the Christian faith. Why? Exactly why? Our, I now come to my people, the Zulus. When King Dingan murdered the four-tracker leader, Peter Tish, the act was watched by Reverend Owen and Reverend Halstead from their mission station, which was built on a hill overlooking King Dingan's great uh, village. Halstead and Owen, unharmed by Dingan, decided to flee from the place after that. And Dingan was deeply sorrowed that his favorite preachers had decided to leave him. And King Taitwayo, the warrior king who won the Battle of Isandwane in 1875 or thereabouts, never harmed missionaries. And a king who followed Tsejuayo, King Dinizub, who was brutally tortured by the English, had a great friend in reverend, in Bishop Colenso, a Christian bishop, and his daughters, one of whom was called Mary. Although he had suffered so much at the hands of the British authorities, King Dinizulu never abandoned his white Christian friends. They comforted him and he depended desperately upon them and their Bible in his darkest hours. Would the same basic story credo be true of how the British um, or the Illuminati based in Britain um, took over Australia too? Yes, I have found exactly the same story. Sir. The Aborigines, like Africans, were deliberately softened up long before they, they were colonized by the white people. There were men, mysterious men, who often posed as gods, who, who undermined the will of the aborigines to resist the encroachment of the colonialists. It's also interesting that Captain Cook, who is the guy who's supposed to have, quote, discovered um, Australia, New Zealand, that area of the world, yes. was actually sponsored and funded and in, in fact controlled by the Royal Society which was a Freemasonic and is a Freemasonic a science operation based in London. Yes, sir. Let, let me show you another interesting thing. There is a man I have been investigating in a vein for over 40 years now. A man who committed acts of hideous genocide upon our people here in South Africa. A man of whom historians are so fond that he is practically a white cow whom you may not dare to point a finger at. If you see me sitting in front of you, a man who was demo demonized over 30 years ago by the South African news media, it was because I asked questions about this white man, Sir George Gray. Who was Sir George Gray? What was he? Was he a Freemason? Was he an Illuminati? How is it that this Sir George Gray, 
who is the, the actual founder of the most oppressive laws that British colonialism ever settled our people with. Apartheid was laid down by Sir George Grey. The carrying of identity papers was laid down by Sir George Grey in the, in the 1850s, in the last century. And Sir George Grey dealt our kings a mortal blow. But let me first tell you, this man was sent from London to quell a Maori rebellion in New Zealand which had defeated the efforts of military men. The Maori were unstoppable. Their rebellion was blazing like a bushfire through New Zealand. But when George Gray was sent to New Zealand, say, he managed to quell this rebellion with very, very little loss of life. What did George Gray do? I have never been able to find a book which tells me exactly what did George Gray do in New Zealand in order to pacify the Maoris who had beaten the efforts of the, sol the British soldiers. Because that same George Gray was brought from New Zealand to South Africa in order to quell a great rebellion by the Khoza people. And George Gray used outright trickery in order to force the Khoza people to actually destroy themselves. George Gray deliberately and cold-bloodedly tricked the Khoza people into slaughtering their own cattle, burning their own crops. It is one of the saddest stories of our country's blood-drenched history. And almost overnight, George Gray reduced the Khoza people of the Eastern Cape into a nation of dying skeletal starvelings. Because after, after George Gray had manipulated the causes with a raw trickery into destroying their crops, destroying their cattle, he practically had them on the plate. Hunger, raw hunger and starvation achieved what military might had failed to, to achieve after many, many embattled decades. George Gray was a psychologist par excellence. George Gray was a trickster who knew the native races and he knew how to exploit their beliefs to, their, to bring about their own destruction. Let me show you what Gray did. One day, when great tension was boiling up in the Cape, and when the, the colonialists were threatened by yet another border war between themselves and the, and the Khoza people, a number of women were, a number of Khoza women, amongst them a Sangoma, a priest, priestess diviner called Nongaus were tending crops when they heard voices calling out to them in the bush. Nongaus, because she was a spiritual person and a healer, responded to these voices. She went together with her sister Nondeto to investigate. And they found 
a deep hollow in the ground and from this hollow they heard the voices coming and as the women knelt next to the hollow the three amazing figures emerged from the grass tall men wearing long black robes made of animal skin with very big hoods on their heads appeared out of the hollow and one of their faces were painted white or so it seemed to the terrified Koza women and they were these men were unusually tall and they told the the woman Nongaus, whom they distinguished by her attire as a traditional healer, that she must go to the Koza people and tell them to start killing their cattle and start destroying their crops. Mr. Ike, I want to show you this book, a book which was published many years ago, a book written by me and which made me one of the most hated black men in South Africa by the white establishment. In this book, I write amongst other things about a man called Sir George Gray. And I, in this book, I questioned certain things about this man because Sir George Gray was the creator of race discrimination and apartheid in South Africa. Apartheid was not really created by the Afrikaners. It was created by this man many, many years ago. Well, Sir George Gray was Illuminati, um, a black magician and uh, fits the bill exactly with what happened in all these other countries you're talking about. Say, when I questioned, the, when I raised questions in this book about Sir George Gray, I was savagely attacked by nearly every professor in various universities of South Africa. The intellectual prostitutes, yeah. Yes. The liars in ivory towers, as I call them. I asked, I said that the 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 Well, let's 